Hello and welcome to Political Talk Show Global Discussion on CBC Channel. I'm Anastasia Lavrina and today we have a special guest, Head of the Department of Foreign Affairs of Presidential Administration of Azerbaijan, Mr. Hikmet Hajiyev. Mr. Hajiyev, hello. And nice to see you. Thank you very much for your kind agreement to give us this interview. That's a pleasure is mine. Thank you. This year, Azerbaijan commemorates 28th anniversary of Hojale massacre committed by Armenian Armed Force and 366 CIS Regiment in 1992. It's already 28th anniversary and still we can see that like Azerbaijan never asked for revenge. We ask for justice, but we can understand that now justice is not been achieved yet. For your opinion, can we expect to see the justice in the nearest time? Thank you. Uh, Hojalu is one of the sad stories in the history of Azerbaijan people. It's an, uh, about the killing of the innocent civilians. It's also about a uh, carnage over the civilian population of Hojali, uh, town of Azerbaijan, that was uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh region of Azerbaijan, as part of the Armenian military aggression and occupation of Azerbaijan's territories. And there was a uh, particular uh, carnage uh, in a merciless manner was conducted over the civilian population back in 1992. Still, the question is that why it has been done by Armenian armed forces with the support of the Soviet regiment at that time uh, displaced in that particular area. The answer is that, as it was said by the pres uh, previous president of Armenia, Sir Sarkisyan, who said that uh, our sole purpose was intimidation of the local population by killing them, and they uh, prepared the ground for further ethnic cleansing of the occupied territories of Azerbaijan. Khojali is a crime against humanity, it's an act of genocide, and there are also elements of the war crimes. In all, it's an act of genocide against Azerbaijan people. You have rightly mentioned that Azerbaijan people doesn't seek a revenge. Azerbaijan people seeks a justice. Khojali is a crime, and every crime should have a punishment. Uh, as a result of the public awareness campaign and also as a result of the diplomatic political efforts that have been launched by Azerbaijan, uh, now we witness that more than 10 countries have recognized Khojali through their national parliaments. And in the meantime, local legislative authorities of certain countries also uh, recognize Khojali as an act of genocide, including the, some international organizations. But of course, Every crime, including the crimes against humanity, uh, gets in you know, a verdict and becomes you know, fully recognized. And also the people who have perpetrated this crime uh, brought to the justice if there is a real court decision or international court decision and a verdict about you know, such crimes. Unfortunately, so far it didn't happen. It's also an expectation and anticipation of the, anticipation of the people who have suffered Khojala genocide and they would like to fulfillment uh, of this crime. Because the Republic of Armenia, according, according to international law, bears a direct uh, legal responsibility for that, including it's an act of the, the genocide. Therefore, it's along with the state responsibility, individuals that time represented in the political military leadership of Armenia, they also bear responsibility for that. It's also an, if we can we can also look at in a certain practices and also precedents precedents with regard to the war crimes and crimes against humanity in some regions where states in the meantime individuals brought to the justice. It was in a case of Yugoslavia and some other areas. Unfortunately, sometimes we also see at the modern international relations politicization of the legal systems as well, including the uh, international uh, criminal uh, justice institutions as well. But uh, Azerbaijan stands hopeful and we will continue to exhort all efforts uh, to bring this issue to the agenda of the international community, including the legal uh, uh, frameworks, and we will continue all our efforts at the national and international level to provide full justice to the uh, crime and including to the victims of this Khojala genocide. Just recently, uh, Mr. President al Hamaliyev had a chance to participate in Munich Security Conference. It was really grandiose events where uh, on the panel on Armenia-Azerbaijan uh, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, he together with the Prime Minister of Pashinyan, Prime Minister of Armenia, together they could speak about the conflict. And it was really uh, terrible to see how Pashinyan preferred to falsify all the history, the facts, and etc. And even he could say that it's Azerbaijani who committed the Khojali genocide. That's something unacceptable. Like, how can you 
from your own perspective and you also as a participant of that conference, how can you determine the position of Armenia as a position of Nikola Pashinyan? Like, why? Why it was uh, like a big shame for, for, for himself, but he could say it in a, in a live broadcast. Indeed, it was in a, a peak of uh, cynicism or a peak of hypocrisy that has been displayed or exhibited by the Armenian Prime Minister denying the very fact of uh, genocide against the uh, Azerbaijani population uh, in Khojala district. In the meantime, he even uh, went further and saying that as if Azerbaijan is committed with uh, crime and so on, it was uh, ridiculous. And referring to some uh, pieces of the paper in uh, some uh, media outlets or whatever. Uh, but there are facts are speaking for themselves. There are real facts on the ground. First. Uh, there is an, uh, uh, witnesses, eyewitnesses of the Khojala genocide who have witnessed this situation. In the meantime, along the people who have been killed in a mass way, there are certain people who have also been taken hostage. And they also suffered in the hostage of the Armenian armed forces, including the young, young women and who also face with you know, violence and uh, some other atrocities by Armenian armed forces. And uh, secondly, there are also witnesses and there are evidences provided by Armenia's political military leadership. Let me just give you two examples, but the one, uh, one of them that I already referred, but then you know, remarks uh, and statement by the previous pre uh, uh, president of Armenia, Serge Sarkisyan, in his interview to Tom Deval, and a British journalist, he himself said that, yes, we did it, and with the sole purpose of exactly. intimidating Azerbaijan it's population. Written exactly. in the papers. It's officially written, and there is a voice record as well. And Sarkisyan was also a person that who personally, along with the Kocharyan, participated in the operational planning and also conduction of this military operation of Hojala genocide. Let me give you another example. There is a one terrorist, the national hero of Armenia, Montemelkanyan. And his brother uh, wrote a book about my brother's road, as if glorifying his terrorist brother's road uh, in all of his processes. And he also said that referring to his brother, referring to the uh, uh, evidences provided by his brother, saying that Arabo and Arama groups, that was a, that was a terroristic groups uh, that coming from the lobby or diaspora Armenian uh, organizations, they also participated in this operation. And they also, he also in this book says that there was a, a direct and deliberate carnage over the civilian population. These are the real facts on the ground and also operational situation of that time uh, demonstrates these facts. But from another side, but current prime minister of Armenia who claims or that he's going to build a, a democratic, so-called democratic Armenia, from another side denying the very existence of these facts and also in a ridiculous manner refuting uh, the fact of Hojala uh, speaks for itself that there are true intentions of Armenia. And unfortunately, the intentions of Armenian side didn't finish only with Hojala. Hojala was only launch pad for the wider and mass ethnic cleansing of Azerbaijani population from the occupied territories of Azerbaijan. And Armenia can't run away from its responsibility. As I already said, Republic of Armenia bears responsibility along with the fact of occupation uh, for the perpetration of the crimes against humanity, facts of the genocide and acts of the genocide and war crimes against the civilian population of Azerbaijan in the seized lands of Azerbaijan. Exactly, but for your opinion, why? Pashinyan himself, he's doing is this. And since the time when he came to power, it's like the position of Armenia has been changed several times. And some experts can claim that this is just a game to prolong the so-called frozen conflict for Armenia. And in the second time, it's for Pashinyan to play internal game for the people who vote for him. Otherwise, he will lose his reputation. Do you also think that this is the main uh, reason for his behavior? Indeed, with uh, different elements uh, that uh, brought together uh, makes us to think that an actual true intention of Armenian side is a combination of all of these factors. And as it was said by President Ilham Aliyev during the Munich uh, Security Conference discussion, but the true intentions uh, of Armenian leadership in general, different Armenian uh, presidents to hold a state quo of occupation by different means. And they always uh, bring on the table of the negotiation different pretexts so that to prolong the uh, occup fact of occupation as long as they can. And it's also the case with uh, Pashinyan. He also denies the fact of Khojala. In the meantime, he uh, refuses to withdraw Armenian troops from the occupied territories of Azerbaijan. That is a key fundamental aspect and uh, 
issue in the resolution of the conflict. And therefore, uh, he uh, continues with policy. But we always said that if Pashinyan also continues the same policy as it has been pursued, pursued by the private leadership of Armenia, we cannot see any breakthrough in the negotiation process. And uh, then the same destiny and the same fate will happen to Pashinyan as well. Because without the resolution of the conflict, Armenia doesn't have any prospects to uh, get out from the situation that there currently is. But also it's about the morality. It's also about an illegal fact. Armenia finally should face the reality on the ground and say, uh, express it in an apology for the crimes that they have committed against Azerbaijani people and also accepting with facts they can go uh, beyond the uh, limitations uh, of this conflict and build civil and normal relations with the neighboring countries, especially with Azerbaijan. Talking about the neighboring countries and about the South Caucasus itself, how do you allay the security level in the region? Security is fragmented and security is undermined, particularly uh, with the very existence of the uh, armenia azerbaijan nagorno karabakh conflict and Armenia's continuous military occupation of Azerbaijan lands. And this conflict is a source of instability and is a source of the security uh, for the uh, wide region. And it also undermines all our efforts to building region-wise cooperative security. Armenians' approach is that they are trying to build their own security at the expense of others. That is a, uh, let's say, it, uh, traditional understanding of the security or feudal understanding of the security when uh, one country or one uh, feudal considered that by occupying the territories of another country or another state, they can provide their own security. No. In a modern terms, we can only think about in a cooperative security or comprehensive security where based on the understanding, based on the mutual respect, and based on the respect of the territorial country of the neighboring countries, we can build sustainable, long-lasting uh, uh, security and uh, cooperation in the region. But um, unfortunately, political military leadership of Armenia fails to understand it. They only focus on the one pretext that uh, security of so-called illegal regime establishing the occupied territories of Azerbaijan as if it's the most important issue and other issues can be ignored or denied. It's in no way. Therefore, the security situation is not favorable and it's because of the Armenia's policy of occupation and aggression against the neighboring country, Azerbaijan. But at the same time, while we see that uh, Armenian position is decreasing month by month and even its relations with neighboring countries is going down, at the same time we can see that Azerbaijan is growing, developing its foreign and internal policy. For example, this participation in a Munich Security Conference and after the visit of Mr. President Al Hamaliyev to Italy, it was at the highest level and just Recently, we also observed the visit of President Erdogan of uh, Turkey, who arrived to Azerbaijan to sign the bilateral relation, to bi bilateral contracts agreements, and etc. So, if we talk about Azerbaijan itself and its foreign policy, what are the key priorities elements are uh, on the agenda at the moment? Yeah, beyond Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict, of course, Azerbaijan focuses on building regional cooperation and uh, within that process bilateral relations with the neighboring countries is one of the priorities for Azerbaijan. As it was uh, highlighted by President Ilham Aliyev that without cooperation with the neighboring countries, Azerbaijan also uh, couldn't be in a position to build with the regional mechanisms of the regional cooperation including the projects uh, that we are implementing. Therefore, Azerbaijan has managed to build with sustainable and mutually beneficial cooperation uh, with all uh, regional countries and with all neighboring countries particularly. And as a result of which we have achieved uh, prosperity and peace uh, in our region uh, beyond, of course, Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict. Therefore, uh, uh, we are now currently satisfied with our bilateral relations with the neighboring countries and uh, we will continue to exert our efforts further to uh, deepen our cooperation and enhance our cooperation with the new projects and initiatives and with the transport initiatives and energy projects are uh, all part of the wider picture that Azerbaijan, together with the partnering countries, has managed to build. And also coming back to that visit of President Erdogan to Azerbaijan on February 25th, the eighth meeting of the Azerbaijan-Turkey High-Level Strategic Cooperation Council was held in Baku. With the participation of President, official documents also have been signed. How do you evaluate this meeting? Like, What else it can bring to Azerbaijan and how it can enlarge the relations with Turkey? 
Uh, relation between Turkey and, and Azerbaijan are special. Of course, and Turkish-Azerbaijan relations, human uh, factor or people-to-people -people contacts and a place an extremely important role as uh, Azerbaijani and Turkish people are sharing ethnic kinship. And this is a fundamental fact, also played it's a crucial role in development of the relations between Azerbaijan and Turkey. And uh, it was an ACE meeting uh, of the uh, council at the level of strategic council, that's in a set, at the level of the president. And the agenda of the meeting was quite comprehensive. It covered political, economic, agricultural, logistic transport, defense and military security, uh, and uh, some other areas and spheres. And with the chairmanship or co-chairmanship to presidents, appropriate government institutions and uh, ministries were involved in the process. And based on our agenda, we had a comprehensive discussion on further development of the economic relations, trade relations, as we already have an excellent political relations. Last year, uh, the trade turnover between Turkey and Azerbaijan was four and a half billion. And we also see, uh, we have also uh, see that 33% progress uh, in uh, and actually growth in our trade turnover between two countries. And uh, it has also strategic ambition by the two presidents that to reach the level of the 15 billion trade turnover between two countries uh, in the upcoming years. And uh, it's also shared vision that it's an achievable, but we should continue our joint efforts further. If we're in an economic trade sphere, we see intensification of our relations. Energy sphere is obvious, but last year in November, two presidents uh, inaugurated or uh, commissioning of the TANAP project as already provides Azerbaijan gas. It's also physically linked with the uh, TAP project. And also defense cooperation, and since the independence of Azerbaijan, defense cooperation with Turkey has uh, tremendously contributed to the buildup of Azerbaijan's armed forces, and it's a modernization program. And in the defense industry sphere, Turkey and Azerbaijan are strategic partners. We are also coordinating our joint approaches, uh, joint work at the international level with regard to the uh, issues of uh, regional and global security. And uh, uh, simply in all spheres, we see intensification of this process and particularly with the Strategic Council provided further ground for development of our cooperation in all spheres. And in this relations particular, I would like to ask you to comment more on defense cooperation between our countries and also about the project on Nakhchivan Cars Railway, which was also discussed during the meeting. Uh, defense cooperation and defense industry cooperation already goes well. As uh, last year, Turkish and Azerbaijani armed forces participated in 13 joint military exercises. And uh, we see uh, it's planned that more than 18 or 20 joint exercises will be conducted. And it provides more interoperability, more understanding and coordination between armed forces of two countries. And also Turkish Azerbaijan military cooperation is one of the uh, fundamental cornerstones of regional security and stability. And uh, also in defense industry, where two countries are uh, supplementing one another's uh, knowledge and capability, uh, that uh, providing further impetus for our cooperation. And also uh, in a railway project, already we have commissioned uh, uh, and fully operational Baku Tbilisi Cars Railway system. And now, uh, as a, a sign of uh, positive agenda of uh, the recent meeting of the Strategic Council, the two presidents agreed and the MOU already signed as well with Nakhchivan Cars Railway. In a sense, we are building in a circle uh, that uh, brings a whole uh, cycle of the railway system of Turkey and Azerbaijan, especially passing the cars. And we do believe that it will provide additional uh, enabling logistic opportunities for Nakhchivan that some cargoes via the cars can easily uh, via the railway system be delivered to Nakhchivan. And both sides have a willingness and resolve uh, on this issue. And therefore through our joint efforts, uh, hopefully in upcoming years, this project will also be finalized and it will be yet another uh, continuation or prolongation of the Baku Tbilisi Cars Railway System. And talking about uh, energy partnership of Azerbaijan with other countries, this year 2020 South and Gas Corridor finally can start its operation when mm. TAP and uh, TANA projects can be fully uh, completed and Azerbaijani gas will be provided to Europe. Talking about energy partnership between Azerbaijan and the European Union, do you think that this, the start of this energy project can also give new impetus for cooperation between Azerbaijan and the European Union? Certainly. Uh, because already the European Union and Azerbaijan are strategic partners on energy affairs and there is also a cooperation agreement signed between the two parties on that issue. 
And we also, from our perspective, do believe that with the completion of the top project, that's in a final segment of the Southern Gas Corridor, uh, it will provide its own uh, contribution to European energy security. And currently, Azerbaijan uh, you know, plays its own role in the energy security of some European countries. Let's take, for example, Italy. 70% uh, of the Italy's oil has been supported as provided by Azerbaijan. And as a top project, will provide as an alternative source of uh, energy, an alternative route of energy to the European market. Indeed, we do believe that uh, with all uh, tenets and particularly uh, by completion of the top project, we will strengthen energy cooperation between EU and Azerbaijan, as we are also expecting that on the 28th of February, uh, new uh, uh, yet another uh, meeting of the advisory council of the Southern Gas Corridor will take place in Baku at the ministerial level and different uh, ministers representing uh, the countries along the TANAP and TAP route uh, will take part and it also provides a good platform including for the European Union to coordinate our joint efforts. And overall talking about the relations between Azerbaijan and the European Union apart from the energy, how can you determine them? Because there were too much conversation talking about some minuses, some misunderstanding between Azerbaijan and European Union, but still we are about to sign a new um, cooperation agreement, apart from the fact that Azerbaijan has never um, expressed the idea to become a member of the European Union. And actually, apart from it, we can see that the relation is quite well developing. So in your opinion, how do you evaluate the level and if there is something else we can work on more? Uh, in general, EU-Azerbaijan relations are, uh, you know, developing in a steady manner, and we are satisfied of our cooperation. Uh, and Azerbaijan also participates in different projects of the European Union. But time by time, having a different opinion, we do think that it's a normal tendency. Uh, and especially when it comes to the partnership agreement that's an under discussion between the parties, there are uh, this document almost 90 percent or 92 percent have been finalized. There are still pending and open issues. But it's also normal that uh, sides may have a different opinion because on the trade issue, as we also see that European, for the European Union, trade is one of the most important chapters. Uh, but we also, our message to European Union is also that we should build such an, a partnership agreement that it provides benefit for both sides. It shouldn't be one-way street. And when uh, the process is in a women's situation or mutually beneficial, it becomes more sustainable and more lasting. It also provides more confidence between the parties. Therefore, we are uh, trying and working on our differences, particularly on energy and trade uh, issues, so that to uh, shorten this gap and to uh, provide uh, opportunities for the completion of this agreement. Azerbaijan is one of the countries which could manage very nice balanced policy in the last years, but still taking into consideration all security matters in the world, the Middle East situation, and etc. For Azerbaijan, is it difficult or it's already like it's normal policy to sustain the balanced policy, like salt and uh, north project, north salt project, sorry, also the relations with the European Union, east, west. So is it becoming more difficult or it's still? Uh, from one side, yes, it's indeed difficult because, uh, you know, as it was said by President Ilham Aliyev, that major sources of the instability, major sources of the threats are uh, actually formed on the outside of the borders of Azerbaijan. And internally, we don't have internal sources of the instability and challenges in Azerbaijan. Uh, from that perspective, uh, we also see and witness deterioration of the relations between the different parties who have in the neighborhood uh, relations with Azerbaijan, who are also uh, among the potential partners of Azerbaijan. This deterioration somehow affects the international peace and security and it also undermines regional peace security as well. And uh, it's also a matter of concern for Azerbaijan that this uh, negative effects could, uh, to a certain extent, uh, affect uh, our security situation as well. Therefore, we're carefully monitoring the situation and we are also, through the silent diplomacy, providing our uh, own uh, regional knowledge and regional understanding so that to build better relations among our partners as well. But from Azerbaijan perspective, key fundamental fact is there is that once uh, you have a predictable foreign policy, when you have a transparent foreign policy, uh, success is guaranteed. That's a key principle of Azerbaijan's foreign policy that every partner of Azerbaijan sees uh, our country as a reliable partner. Azerbaijan, uh, based on this positive agenda, tries to build regional cooperation, tries to build understanding 
at the national level and the regional level, and also through the non-aligned movement process that brings together 100 different countries, not in all our region, but from many different parts of the world. And do we have any special impetus to develop and to make it more stronger the partnership with the regional powers? Especially on the Caspian Sea, probably with Georgia, with Russia, with Iran. Do we have such kind of... Yes, indeed. Actually, we have our intense, first of all, bilateral relations. International system, actually, is based on the bilateral cooperation among the states. Therefore, uh, first important line for us is the building of our bilateral relation. And then uh, we are also trying to develop the concept of the trilateral cooperation with the uh, like-minded countries that we can see between Turkey, Azerbaijan, Georgia. Uh, that's yet another important component of the regional cooperation or Azerbaijan, Russia, Iran cooperation or Azerbaijan, Turkey, uh, Turkmenistan. And uh, we can continue this list. And we also see that along with the bilateral agenda, bilateral cooperation, trilateral cooperation mechanisms are also uh, elements of the strengthening regional peace and security. And in your opinion, uh, what is the role of cultural diplomacy in Azerbaijan foreign policy? Because also during this visit of Mr. President to Italy, 2020s was determined as a year of Azerbaijan culture in Italy. How do you think what kind of role the cultural diplomacy can play? Cultural diplomacy is one of the priorities of Azerbaijan's foreign policy, along with the cultural diplomacy, sport diplomacy, humanitarian diplomacy, as we can name it. It's also one of the important instruments of the soft power as for, for Azerbaijan as for many other countries because Azerbaijan is cherished to have it's a unique culture uh, that's based on the inclusivity that's based on the richness traditions and also it has its own history and uh, we should also uh, particularly state with fact that in cultural diplomacy of Azerbaijan first vice president Mehriban Kharam Aliyeva plays a tremendously important role and from one side it uh, as a result of this uh, efforts Azerbaijan culture brought to the attention of the international community especially via UNESCO and through the bilateral cultural programs uh, in the meantime uh, world community become more uh, informed about the cultural values of Azerbaijan and this process also respects the cultural values of other countries uh, you have rightly mentioned Italy as a result of uh, Mr. President's visit, a state visit to Italy in 2020, Azerbaijan Cultural Year, Year of Azerbaijan Culture was launched in Italy, and intense cultural programs will be implemented in Italy so that Italian people may uh, get a better understanding, knowledge about Azerbaijan cultural values. In the meantime, through the efforts of Merban Khanam Aliyeva, Azerbaijan contributes to the cultural uh, exchanges and cultural richness between different countries and Azerbaijan. Yet one example is the uh, contribution to the archaeological excavations in Rome, as a result of which important artifacts have been found uh, that also uh, represents uh, Italian or ancient Roman history and culture. We do think that it's also part of the uh, wider uh, human civilization and culture. And Azerbaijan also contributed to the renovation of the catacombs in the Vatican. Uh, these are all elements that inclusive cultural uh, philosophy of Azerbaijan and Azerbaijan respects its own culture and promotes its own culture. At the meantime, Azerbaijan respects the cultures of other civilizations and other countries. And it's yet indeed one of the key priorities and cornerstone principles of Azerbaijan foreign policy. And my final question for you, it's, it will be overall about international relations system. How Azerbaijan and how you personally maybe see the international relations system, the law system itself? Because coming back to our first questions, we are talking about Hoja Ali genocide, we are talking about Armenia, Azerbaijan, Nagorno Karabakh conflict itself. How still Azerbaijan trust, believe and rely on international system? Azerbaijan is part of the international system. Azerbaijan is also subject of the international law as a sovereign state. But of course, uh, the developments of the international level that's going on currently uh, uh, cannot be, uh, can in no way be considered satisfactory. We see a lot of elements of the contradiction and controversies, and we also see uh, the diminishing role of the international law, law or law-based, uh, rule-based approach at the international level. That's also a matter of the concern for Azerbaijan. And we also see double standards, unfortunately, in the international system that there is a uh, diminishing role of the international law. As you have rightly mentioned also, we see it with regard to Khojala genocide, with regard to the continuous uh, occupation of Armenia against Azerbaijan, uh, where uh, uh, sometimes the international community uh, you know, uh, pursues a policy uh, that provides impunity for Armenia as a result of this uh, conflict they have, or war they have unleashed against Azerbaijan. Uh, 
but from our perspective, we are con continuing to contribute to the strengthening of the international system based on the justice, based on the norms and principles of international law. Just one example, uh, let me share that when uh, Azerbaijan chaired and assumed the chairmanship of non alignment movement for the 2019-2022, uh, one of the priorities that Azerbaijan has identified is the commitment to Bandung principles. Bandung principles uh, coincides well with Azerbaijan's own foreign policy priorities. In the meantime, Bandung principles are coinciding with the norms and principles of international law. It's about the sovereignty of the states, territorial integrity, non-interference in internal affairs, and also uh, it's about you know, pursuing the positive agenda at the international level and mutually beneficial cooperation. Azerbaijan will continue its efforts for uh, the building up more stability, security, and cooperation at the international level based on the experience that we have managed to build at the regional level. We wish you good luck and thank you very much for this interview. Thank you. Just to remind you, watch the political talk show Global Discussion on CBC Channel. Today we had a special guest head of the Department of Foreign Affairs of Presidential Administration of the Republic of Azerbaijan, Mr. Hikmet Gadjev. See you in the next edition of Global Discussion.